Thank you, Mick. Well, we need no introduction for uh, Dr. Wayne Schmidt. He's ready to go and fired up. Yes. Anything else you want to say? Proceed. Thank you. Uh, I appreciated so much our time together last night and uh, Ed's talk and uh, um, one of the things he drew us to during that time was uh, the uh, Acts 15:12 and the moment that happened. And I appreciated uh, Blaze and Mick uh, standing up and sharing some of the moments that are happening in the life of their church. So in my nine minutes this morning, I want to talk about movements and messes. Because I'm convinced that the Acts 15:12 moment would have never happened without the mess in Acts 15, 1 to 6. So if we're talking about becoming a movement, we're warned in advance that there will be some messes along the way. And if you as a church are called to be a movement, undoubtedly there will be some messes. Now, hear this. You can have a mess without a movement. <laughs> but I'm not convinced you can have a movement without a mess. The two kind of go together. In fact, uh, in Acts, as we referred to last night, you have the uh, apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, and their role, whatever they are, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, is to equip God's people. And when that happens, the body of Christ can be built up. We talked about that on the front end of this movement tend to be the roles that are more catalytic at the beginning. Now, the Spirit of God is the ultimate catalyst, but these individuals tend to be anointed to be the early conductors or conduits of that movement. And so it tends to move this way. The problem is, on the front end of this spectrum, there is more mess. And on the other end of this spectrum, there is less mess. Let me just say, every one of these roles is indispensable to the church. If we're going to be a movement, every one of these individuals need to be engaged with us. But it tends to be the case that those who are shepherds and teachers are less messy than those who are apostles, prophets, and evangelists. Part of being catalytic is being messy. So, as we move this way, less mess, but also the tendency of the movement to become institutionalized. Now, what denominations have tended to do because of their structures and because of their institutionalization is they've tended to be more comfortable with these folks and a little unsettled by these folks. And the way they've managed the mess is to marginalize these voices and these roles and to institutionalize these voices and these roles. And both marginalization and institutionalization deal with the mess, but in the unintended consequence of that is it kills the movement. Now let me be clear, making a mess is not a sign that someone is an apostolic multiplier. <laughs> That is not the, the evidence. There are a lot of people who are gifted at making messes who aren't gifted to be apostolic multipliers. And denominations have this tendency to reduce the mess through marginalizing the apostolic multipliers. And just to tag on to what Mick just said, I wonder also if there's a tendency to marginalize the Spirit of God as he works in powerful and uncontrollable ways. I was talking to Josh Ratliff, a pastor in South Carolina recently, and 
He says something that so captivated me. He said in 1 Corinthians 12, God's working and there's a mess because of it. And he said when it comes to 1 Corinthians 14, the Apostle Paul has to try to bring order to it. He said the way the church tends to deal with the messes God's spirit creates, if I can humbly use that language, is we tend to marginalize the spirit of God and the ways he wants to show his work. He says we're never to deal with God's uh, untamed spirit by marginalizing, but we are still responsible to bring order so that people benefit collectively from what's going on. Boy, that spoke to me. How many times in my life, because of people or the, because of the way God chose to work, I tended to just shove it a little bit to the side. So if we're going to be a movement, we're going to have a mess. Can we own that? Mm -hmm. And there are two things I want us to know. The first thing is this, that we must choose trust over tension. Trust must be greater than tension. Now last night I said we're beginning a story and there are chapters yet to be written. And I said together we're going to invent the future. I referred to it as co-invention. I'm personally convinced that co-invention benefits from tension. So the way to deal with this is not to eliminate the tension. It's not to reduce the tension. It's the tension, it's the, the give and take, the pushback, the honest dialogue that's going to help us get through this. The goal is not to reduce the tension, it's to increase the trust. What's going on in Acts chapter 15 is not just reducing tension, it's people who see things differently getting together and building trust because of the differences in their ministry. And many of you are familiar with the book Speed of Trust by Covey who really talks about this dimension. The second thing is if we're going to experience this tension in a way that's, that's not going to work, that's helpful, this is something I learned recently from a couple of people, uh, Duffy Smith and Dominic Turnbull. They said in order to be a movement, in order to uh, live together in trust, even when there's tension, you have to have big relationships. And the way they illustrated that is, let's say God has given you a vision. He's given us a vision as the Wesleyan Church, transforming lives, churches, and holiness, uh, uh, transforming lives, churches, and communities through the hope and holiness of Jesus Christ. And in order to accomplish that vision, there has to be some kind of a strategy. And that strategy that God has given to us is that we will be celebrating every time a disciple makes a disciple and the church multiplies itself until we have a transforming presence in every zip code. That's our vision, our strategy. And in order for that to happen, there have to be certain uh, supportive systems that are built in. And Ed talked about that last night, and he has a particular genius as an apostolic multiplier to develop these systems. He talked about the eight systems that are so necessary. But the point they made that was so powerful to me was this. At the base of all of this is relationships. And they said, how big are your relationships? Because your vision, your strategy, your supportive systems will never be bigger than your relationships. So, if your relationships are only this big, this means your systems will be a bit bigger than, a bit smaller than that, and your strategy will be even a bit smaller than that, and your vision will be a bit smaller than that. You cannot have a big vision and small relationships. So we've got to ask ourselves, because we're becoming a movement, I believe that, and because there's a mess on its way, I can already feel the clouds on the horizon. <laughs> If we do not have trust over tension, and if we do not have 
big relationships, we're not going to make it because we're not going to have enough wiggle room for the Spirit of God to work so that our vision can become reality. Now, here's my challenge for you. If we're going to be a movement, build your local churches to the... I mean, the local church is the hope of the world. It's the front lines. But don't have all of your big relationships be in your local church. Have some of your biggest relationships be beyond your local church. Because that's what fuels a movement. Please don't create a setting where you only lead people who are under your authority. Some of your greatest leadership will come as you are in deep and big relationship with people who are your peers and not under your authority by leading laterally, leading up, not just leading those who are in your wake. Have an Acts 15 spirit. Be apostolic multipliers who practice mutual voluntary submission. We want to give you organizational flexibility, but have relational accountability. So I ask you, is your relationship with God big enough for the vision he's entrusted to you? And is your relationship with each other big enough for the vision he's entrusted to you?